hope you are there. Yes, hi, I'm still here. Hello. Okay, hi. So I will not take any longer. Stage is yours. Like if uh, someone is uh, watching online and wants to ask some questions, feel free to, to write on the uh, YouTube channel and we will ask questions uh, afterwards in uh, Q&A session. So, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It feels great to be here. Let me try and share my screen and hopefully you can see what I'm seeing. Let me know if you can't. Um, hi, so nice to be here at this meetup and talk to all of you. Uh, I see some of you are gathered, gathered physically, which is nice. Uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Sara Bayman. I am a software engineer at Microsoft at the Development Center here in Oslo, Norway. I am actually Swedish though, and I usually joke about how that is a distinction which is only important to Scandinavians, but I'm guessing there's a few Scandinavians here, so it might be important to you. Uh, in my sort of day job, uh, I work uh, in a, uh, under a team called People Services, and we own a set of APIs for profile data and profile images within, well, Microsoft 365, but also a bit uh, beyond that. Um, this is my, I think, fifth meetup or conference uh, remote now. And it's getting like a little bit less weird every time. At least this time I can see some of you. Usually I can't see anyone, but I used to be a dancer. And when you're on stage, you have this really, really bright stage light in your eyes. So you can't really see anyone in the audience then either. So you should just pretend that my webcam is my stage light and that, you know, everything's as normal. But yeah, enough about me uh, and well, if you think this is interesting, you can ask me afterwards, but that's not really what we'll talk about today. Uh, we'll talk about this, is machine learning sustainable? Um, and when we talk about sustainability within uh, machine learning or AI or really the whole computer science field, we usually talk about the computational need first. Um, and the second part is uh, hardware or improving hardware. And as for uh, machine learning and AI, hardware has truly been uh, an enabler since uh, AI has been this idea for a very long time, ever since Turing's article back in the 50s. But it's really only recently that it's starting to become infused in products that we see and use every day. So, and that's a lot thanks to hardware making it better over time. Uh, so yeah, if we can make hardware greener and we can run uh, on only green energy, then we can make uh, machine learning a lot more sustainable. It's maybe a no-brainer uh, to some of you, maybe uh, not. Uh, but the question here is what we're trying to delve into this session is, is that enough? What about the software side? What about um, the computational need first? And that's what we will go into and I will take you with me for the ride. Um, there will be a Q&A after this. Uh, so if you have any questions, note them down, especially I've left like the slide number. So if there is a graph or something that you're interested in, note the number and we can go back to that later. I will firstly try and cover why we should care about this, why is sustainability of software really important. And then I will also talk about how we can measure the carbon cost. A carbon footprint is something a lot of people talk about for all different things. Uh, but how do you really go from like a piece of code to a, a, a concrete value in CO2 equivalents? And then I will talk about some research from the field. I will talk both about uh, like research papers, also more blog posts. Uh, some of them try to, to point out the connection between like amount of um, work done by software and the energy consumptions and other are more focused on like the accuracy of machine learning uh, and the sustainability. And then lastly, I will try and give you some pointers to what you can do. If you're a software engineer and you write machine learning code, what can you do to make it greener and what are your options? All right, so why should we care if machine learning is sustainable? Well, I think the first reason is obvious. The world confronts an urgent carbon problem and if we don't uh, curb emissions and temperatures cont continue to climb, science tells us that the results will be catastrophic. And I don't like anything that has the word catastrophic in it, um, so I would like to avoid that. 
uh, as for how important the whole ICT sector is in comparison to other sectors, there isn't a ton of new research. When you read like other research papers, there is one paper from 2010, which is the most heavily cited, uh, which measured like the worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. And that paper puts the ICT sector at around 2% of the worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. And that is actually on par with the aviation sector. And the first time I heard this, I was quite surprised uh, because people talk a lot about like how sustainable was your vacation? You flew all that way. Was that really the good choice? But no one's ever talked that way about, oh, did you watch Netflix uh, on your sofa all of last evening? Or you spend an hour scrolling Instagram? How sustainable is that? That isn't really a conversation we're used to having. Um, there's also some newer research actually from here in Euro Europe um, from 2015. And that puts the ICT sector as responsible for around 4% of the European greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but we have to remember here that in Europe, we don't have as much manufacturing as we have in other parts of the world, which is a big uh, part of, uh, of the worldwide uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So 4% might be a bit high. Uh, so yeah, the numbers are maybe not exactly clear, but what is very clear is that they're non-negligible. They're definitely uh, making an impact uh, on our daily lives. So that was the, the first reason. The second one uh, might be less obvious at first, but it is to democratize AI and to democratize machine learning. Because if machine learning is computationally very heavy, if it requires a lot of resources to do this, it raises the barriers for who can afford to do it. It essentially limits it to companies, you know, a few universities and, and maybe a few people who actually have the resources to do this sort of cutting edge research. And in the end, this blocks everyone since the research in the field is blocked. Okay, so if this is the first time you're contemplating the sustainability of software, it can maybe feel something like this. I, I have this piece of code, it's running on a, on a server, some magic happens, and then like out comes a carbon footprint. And it can definitely feel this way, uh, and there are a lot of aspects that come into it, especially if we start talking scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Um, and that's where you start to calculate things like how much carbon was spent to build this machine I'm running in. What about the network cables? And, and you can really make it uh, as big as you want. Uh, but we're not trying to solve all of those problems in these 45 minutes. So we'll instead focus on the actual cost of running the software in this presentation. So what's, what's in this box if you're talking about software? How can you measure that carbon cost? Well, carbon um, strictly comes from electricity. Like when we run software, we need to consume electricity uh, and that has a vague connection to carbon, right? Um, so what you can do is you can measure the electricity that your server consumes. If you can buy like sheep watt meter and plug that into the wall, that's going to be the easiest. Um, there are some caveats to be aware of, especially if you're not used to measuring electricity, um, but it can definitely be done and it will be fairly reliable. Um, you can also measure using software uh, to see the individual components, like how much uh, energy is my, uh, my CPU consuming during this operation and things like that. So there are some tricks uh, to help you. But sometimes you can't measure uh, the electricity, and in those cases, you would have to estimate. For example, if you're running on the cloud, you can't really go and knock on the door of the data center and, hey, can I please insert this watt meter in the wall? Will likely not end well for you, so don't endorse that. Um, but there are other ways you can move around that electricity problem. So you can do that. Um, by going over the specs of the hardware you're running on and you can make the uh, decisions on how much electricity consumes. This can go quite detailed and that's not really the point of this talk. Just know that there are ways to do this uh, if you want to. So once you have electricity uh, of your software, you really want to go to that CO2 equivalent. And that is uh, 
a number called carbon intensity. That's what we use that for. The carbon intensity is basically a number which tells you how much carbon was released uh, for producing this one unit of energy. For example, I sit in Norway right now where we run on, I think, 98 or 99 percent hydro, which is a renewable source. Uh, so the carbon intensity is going to be very low uh, because it, but it's never going to be free, right? Uh, but the, the amount of carbon release is very low. If we were to look at other examples, as for example, Poland, who are famous for burning a lot of coal, the carbon intensity is going to be a lot higher because coal is not a renewable source. And I've now said carbon like a thousand times or CO2 equivalents. And um, what does that mean? We perhaps remember from chemistry that it's like an atom and it goes into the air and it's not good. But the CO2 equivalence is really a value that is used a lot within uh, the scientific community to convert all greenhouse gases into one single number, because that makes it a lot easier to compare and, and reason over. Because, for example, if we, we look at uh, methane, that's another greenhouse gas which is uh, emitted a lot in, in farming. And one kilo of methane has the same global warming potential as 84 kilos of CO2. But then it lasts uh, shorter in the atmosphere compared to CO2. And already here, like my high school chemistry is, is not enough to, to follow along anymore. Um, so it is, it is rather complex and that's why CO2 equivalence is used as like a, a global baseline uh, for when we talk about this. And the most research uh, I cite here will use that value. So how can carbon intensity look like? Um, here is it's a pretty cool API. It's a website. You can check it out. It's called Electricity Map. Um, I think it's pretty cool. It's based on open source data. It has data, as you can see, not for all countries, but quite a lot, even outside of Europe. Um, and it also has an open API, so you can play around with it if you want to uh, use that for something and build a carbon aware software that moves around depending on where the wind is blowing or, or something like that. Uh, in this example, I selected Sweden and as you can see, it's it's very green compared to a lot of the other places in Europe, only 30 grams of carbon. Um, and a lot of the energy sources in Sweden are low carbon, but not all of them are renewable. For example, we use a lot of um, nuclear power in Sweden. So yeah, I, I recommend checking this out if you found like carbon super interesting uh, and what we can do about that. But OK, let's let bring it back to machine learning, which we're here to talk about. What should we be comparing if we want to talk about sustainability of machine learning? What, what should we compare? Because as you know, depending on how you twist and turn your data, you can support different claims, you can paint different pictures and um, yeah, tell the different story essentially. So I will use two blog posts from the OpenAI blog to demonstrate what I mean by this. And it's a fairly good blog if you haven't heard of it before. Uh, I recommend checking it out and giving it a read. And both of these examples will be on the convolutional neural networks. So what we can do is we can either uh, compare performance of the same data set over time. And that's sort of a measure of the efficiency of AI. Or uh, we can instead compare state-of-the-art algorithms to other state-of-the-art algorithms from different points in time and then look at how the computational need have changed. So let, let's start with the first example, efficiency over time. And here's a graph. Uh, don't be scared. We'll break it down step by step. Uh, so here on the x-axis, we have years. It starts at 2012 and ends uh, this year. On the y-axis, we have uh, teraflop days. And basically, um, that is, if you've never heard of flops, it's a way of quantifying how much work your CPU does, essentially. And this whole graph is in log scale. And what this graph shows and what their experiment was, it was to show the amount of compute that was needed to train a convolutional neural network uh, on a specific data set called ImageNet, and then classify it to the same accuracy as their starting point, which was AlexNet. So basically what they did was to hold the performance of their uh, system constant. And then they used open sourced re-implementations of publications of neural networks, which were known to have a high accuracy. 
and then they measured the progress over this ImageNet data source over time. And they focus on like the final training cost of the model, so no development cost is included here. And what this shows basically is that since 2012, the amount of compute needed for the task has been decreasing by a factor two every 16 months. So compared to 2012, it now takes 44 times less compute to train a neural networks to the same level of AlexNet. We talked in the beginning of hardware, so if we compare it to like classic hardware gains and Moore's law, that we yield only the dilation. Okay. <laughs> Right, where was I? Moore's Law. Well, yeah, Moore's Law would only yield uh, an 11 time cost improvement over the same um, time period. So 44 and 11 times, that's quite a big difference. And it, it's really interesting because what this essentially show is that algorithmic progress in this area have yielded more gains than classic hardware efficiency. And it may continue to do so over time. And it like paints a very nice picture, don't you think? It's the going down. We talk about sustainability and like carbon emissions. Like we really like when things go down. Um, but we we know that there is a very strong focus within the machine learning and AI community to obtaining this state of the art results, gaining a higher and higher accuracy on harder and harder tasks. And this is exemplified by the popularity of uh, leaderboards, and they typically report like accuracy. Uh, or related measures, but they never mention like the cost or efficiency. So while the last graph was really interesting, it's not likely the biggest driver of carbon emissions in the area. So what happens if we look at this second example, if we compare state of the art algorithms uh, to each other and see how the need for computation have changed over time. Okay, another graph. Uh, this also has years on the x-axis. It stops a bit sooner. It's a bit older uh, paper, uh, two years old, and it had petaflops days here on the y-axis instead. And if you're uh, very interested in prefixes, I can tell you that a petaflop is a thousand times a teraflop. If you're not, doesn't matter. You just see it as uh, a way to measure compute. How much work does your CPU need to do? This graph is also in log scale. So what they did here instead is to um, show the amount of compute which was used in some of the largest AI training runs of their time. So they chose models to analyze um, that were relatively well known and that used a lot of compute for their time. So sort of the bad boys of the of that year. Uh, and of course, there had to be enough uh, information so they can actually estimate the compute use. And then they measured the compute that was used to train one single model because that, they believed that was a good approximation for how powerful the best models are. Okay, so this graph goes the other way, it goes quite steeply upwards. And this shows uh, that since 2012, the amount of compute that is used has been increasing exponentially with a 3.4 month doubling time, which is very, very fast. If we again compare it to classic hardware and Moore's law, that has only a two year doubling time. So since 2012, this metric has grown over 300,000 X. If we have a two year doubling time, that's seven X. Very big difference. Uh, and how has this been financed, you wonder? Well, it's largely been supported by, by more and better and more expensive hardware. For example, the increased use of GPUs uh, and increased parallelization. And yeah, the hardware will continue to accelerate machine learning, um, but the authors of this paper at least argue um, that the cost will eventually limit how much we can parallelize things, and the physics will eventually limit how efficient we can make the chips. So in conclusion, this trend is not likely to continue in the sort of long or medium time frame, but in the short time frame, it's very likely that it will continue to increase this rapidly. Okay, uh, by now I'm sure some of you are thinking, what about, why are you so negative? Uh, what about all the good that AI machine learning can do for the environment? Can we like use this? Can we like use it to decrease the impact on global warming? Or like this carbon intensity that you mentioned, can we, can we use AI or machine learning to estimate this and make things smarter? 
Yeah, absolutely. I am not saying stop using all this great tech. Uh, I'm a software engineer myself. I enjoy writing code. I would like to keep doing that. Um, and the most carbon efficient software that was ever written was in fact never written. And that doesn't sound fun, so we're not going to go down that route. Road. But what I am saying is that if we don't have this cornerstone knowledge on how to measure the sustainability of machine learning, that we can't even start to reason over the rest. What we need is to start to critically think about this. And when we're in meetings and when we're in conversation to, to have that in the back of our minds and, and there to ask those questions like how much carbon can I spend on developing this model before the cost of development is actually greater than the carbon savings? And for, for how long do I have to use this awesome carbon saving AI solution until I paid off that carbon debt of deployment? And what is the sufficient accuracy for this task and how much carbon and not only money am I willing to pay for that? And if I need something that's uh, super competition heavy and super uh, high accuracy, maybe for security reasons, then what other options do I have to minimize this impact? And I will use um, an example, uh, which is Expressen in Sweden. It's a newspaper. Uh, they still deliver like physical, a lot of it's online these days, but they still deliver physical uh, newspapers to, um, I think it's around 6,000 places in Sweden. Uh, so the thing about newspapers, right, is the day after they aren't really that interesting anymore. You don't want to read a newspaper that's like a day or a week old. Um, so if newspapers don't get sold, they get returned. What they started using at Expressen is to use machine learning to predict uh, how much newspaper is delivered to e uh, each place. And what they found out that they actually have fewer papers returned, which meant less waste. And yeah, it's, it, newspapers are fairly easy to recycle, um, but it's even better if we can stop things being produced before the recycle. Like that is a higher value than recycling something that we already made. Okay, uh, so now it's time for some research. I heard this slide scares people. Don't get scared. Uh, if, um, this is very similar to what we talked about in the beginning. But this is a paper uh, which is very influential in this field. It's heavily cited. Uh, I can definitely recommend reading it if you like reading uh, scientific papers. Or if not, there's a, like a bunch of medium posts uh, which is sort of summarizing it. But basically what this paper did was to characterize the dollar cost and carbon emissions of deep learning in natural language processing. And they did this in two parts. So uh, they first did it for like a, a variety of like off the shelf NLP models. And the second part was more of a case study of the development cost and, and how to transfer models between different tasks. But I'm going to show you the results. But in order for us to understand the result, we sort of want to understand how they arrived to it. So this is very similar to what I showed in the beginning. Like you have power and you have carbon intensity and you get this CO2 equivalence out. And nothing scary here. The only thing is this new thing in the middle, which is the power usage efficiency, effectiveness, sorry. And this is basically a ratio, which is used mainly for data centers and to tell how efficiently they use this uh, energy. We want that to be one. That means for every unit of energy in, everything is used for computation. They used this value, which was the American standard uh, two years ago. And this essentially means that this uh, 58, uh, 0.58 are going to things that is not compute. So mostly it's going to be cooling and waste and, and other things. They also used a um, constant for the carbon intensity in pounds because they are American and that's what they like to use. So, um, this is the uh, equation that they use to get to the numbers. And this is how they, we talked in the beginning also, you can like estimate the electricity or you can measure it. They did sort of a mix. So they measured three components. They measured the CPU, the DRAM, so the memory and uh, the GPU. Uh, and they said, you know what, that's, that's good enough for what we're going to do. That's not going to count for every single thing in, in when running. Uh, a server, as you know, but it's going to be the biggest contributors. Okay, so what, what did they actually arrive at? 
So yeah, as I said, the first part was to characterize the dollar cost and carbon emissions for training a variety of popular off-the-shelf models. So they analyzed four models, Transformer, Elmo, BERT, and GPT-2. And here on the left is uh, the consumption in carbon for like everyday lives. Because if you say one kilo of carbon, like CO2, I have no idea what I can get for that. So here's like something to, to reference. And here is the actual results. So here are the models, Transformer, Elmo, BERT, um, and NAS is the Transformer with Neural Architecture Search. And here are the results, it's the CO2 column. And what's quite interesting, it gets very expensive very quickly. So this BERT, which is fairly popular, uh, is almost the same cost as a trans-American flight. And this is just to train. This is excluding the cost of developing. And then if we look at the transformer, it's actually five times a car lifetime. So I don't know how many cars you've had in your life, but I've not had anyone yet, <laughs> maybe one day. Um, but I'm sure I've used services that use a transformer underneath the hood. So I'm fairly sure I've contributed to this very high number, or at least consumed it in one way or another. So that was quite interesting, uh, I think at least. It was a lot higher than what I expected when I first started reading this paper. And I also said they did a second part. It, it's not, uh, they didn't have as good data for that, but that was basically, basically a case study to estimate uh, how expensive it was to uh, develop new models. And what they found was that this cost is even higher than only training the models. So what this paper, what we like take away from this paper is that uh, training NLP models and developing new ones has a significant cost for the environment in terms of CO2 emissions. Okay. Here's another paper. This is a master thesis where they, as you can see from the title, aim to find a methodology for a fair evaluation of machine learning algorithms with respect to resource consumption. Because as we mentioned before, a lot of papers and leaderboards really only mention like accuracy and, and those related metrics, but they don't talk about efficiency or resource consumption. Uh, so what this paper or this thesis did uh, was that they used three different image data sets and three different text data sets. They had three different machine learning algorithms and then they run them. And they chose to measure, so they didn't estimate, they actually measured the energy consumption of both the CPU and the GPU, and then they compared it against the accuracy of the models, which is quite interesting. So the one to the left is an image, or sorry, a text uh, data set, and this is an image data set. Uh, no, it's the other way around. Never mind. Uh, this graph is also in log scale. And you have accuracy here uh, on the x-axis and the training energy in Joule here. And what you can see here is that for fairly small gains in accuracy, we pay a significant energy cost. So especially for this, like the, it goes up very, very quickly. Uh, we're not getting a lot of uh, like value for that energy cost. And, and that's quite interesting, and it's also shown in other papers. For example, uh, this green AI paper. Uh, they also put, uh, like a lot of, I think it's quite funny, a lot of uh, papers you're gonna find in this field, they have the name green in it, uh, which I think is quite fun. Um, and they categorized AI into green AI and red AI. So what green AI is, it's basically, research that yields a novel result, uh, something like new and interesting that doesn't increase, increase uh, the computational cost and ideally even reduces it. And then red AI, which is like the bad AI, which is typically what we just think is state of the art uh, research. And that is AI research with, uh, which seeks to obtain this really state of the art uh, result in accuracy or related metrics by using massive computational power. So that was the first part. The second part is they suggested, like the master thesis, to find a way to, to more fairly compare how, like, okay, we did this division, but how do I know which um, research paper belongs to where? 
So what they suggested is to use floating point operations as a concrete measure uh, of the sustainability of an algorithm. And this is basically the, the total number of floating point operations that was required to generate a result. And this is like floating point operations is good because it provides an estimate both of like the amount of work that is performed by a computational pro uh, process, but also how long it's going to run, uh, which we know like if we use something that uses energy for longer, it's going to consume more energy. And then they took existing uh, research to showcase this new metric. And here are two of the graphs from their results. So the top uh, ones for both is the accuracy. And the middle one is the, the new one suggested by them. So the floating, floating point operations in billions. FPO is the same as flops, but flops has a bit of a, uh, it can mean two different things. It can mean floating operations or floating operation per second, which can lead to a lot of confusions, which is why they spell it FPO. Uh, and then the second is the number of parameters. And here, the set of graphs on the left is very similar to one of the first things we looked at. So this is like the improve, improvement uh, or change um, from 2012 of an AlexNet, which we've not seen before, to 2018. And the graph on the right, on the other hand, is one model, and then they just increase the number of layers. So there's a lot of uh, data here, but what I find the most interesting is that once again, we pay a pretty significant cost in terms of computation for very little gains in accuracy. Like here, we go from like, we don't even increase a whole percentage point in accuracy, and we pay a lot in floating point operations. And same here, we yeah we gain we go from 77.4 to 78.4 in accuracy, still, you know below 80, but we almost double uh, the amount of work we have to do to get there. And the first time I saw this, I was quite surprised um, because we we usually talk about like how much do we need to get to that uh, goal accuracy, what's like that that's the only thing we really care about like how accurate is your model but if we look at this like if i can decrease um the impact almost by half by just settling for a little less accuracy then that might be worth it okay so good job for making it through all of the research i know they can get quite dusty uh, after a while uh, so pat yourself on the shoulder uh, what's the conclusion? Well, these papers shows that machine learning comes with a significant carbon or a computational cost, and, and that is translated into a significant carbon cost. And there are indications that this is getting worse rather than better. But we have seen that the efficiency of AI is getting better. We are literally getting more bang for less bucks, but only if we can settle for less than state of the art accuracy. There are also more and more research in this field, and uh, this question is being asked and answered a lot more if we just compare it to a few years ago. So there is some light on the horizon. But I'm sorry if you came here to hear that the machine learning is sustainable. <laughs> but what can you do? What can you do to um, well, improve at least for, for your team or your company? Uh, this is... Um, like a pyramid within waste management. Reduce, reuse, recycle. I'm not sure if you heard of it, but my dad is a chemist who works with waste management, so I grew up hearing this a lot. There are also more R words to this, but I, I couldn't really find of a good uh, like computer science comparison to burning something to get uh, ashes. So we're just going to stick to these three. And the important, or the the thing about these three is that they have different values. So it's better if you can reduce something before, like if we talk about uh, clothing, if you can produce less clothing, that's much more sustainable uh, than re reusing them. But reusing in turn is better than recycling, which is in turn better than just throwing something away. So can we apply this mindset to our machine learning? We, we can at least try. So you can choose to reduce your accuracy hunger. Uh, you can honestly contemplate when you're doing a new project, what accuracy do I actually need for this task? And how much am I willing to pay for that extra carbon? As we see, it can rise fairly quickly. And is it really worth um, those 
extra tons of carbon that you're releasing into the uh, atmosphere. And, and here we really have to reflect what can be done safely and what cannot be done safely. If we're talking maybe self-driving cars, you probably really want that extra percentage uh, of accuracy. But if we're talking um, like a recommendation site for like an online retailer, then yeah, maybe, you know, that extra percentage, sure, it will increase the sales, but will it also increase our electricity bill by a lot? Maybe then the electricity eat up that uh, profit. We at least have to contemplate and be aware of that that's a trade-off we are doing. Uh, otherwise, it's like impossible to improve. If you have no idea what you're even trying to achieve, then it's really hard to go in that direction. But let's say you need that high accuracy or you want to do even more. Uh, so the, the accuracy ties very much into the overall electricity consumption, but there was another part, right? There was a carbon intensity part that, that was sort of the bridge between electricity and, and carbon emissions. So you can actually reduce your carbon intensity and you can do this by planning the training of the models. Maybe you're running things uh, on-prem, uh, like uh, on your site. Maybe you can move to the cloud uh, of a cloud provider that is either powered by or um, matched by renewables or is actively carbon offsetting. Or uh, you can plan a time-wise when you're training your models. We know that in, in fact, most countries of the world, the electricity grid is gonna struggle in the morning when everyone's going up, taking a shower, going to work. And in the afternoon when we're all home and putting in a little of dishes and washes and, you know, um, have all the lights on in our home. So maybe those aren't optimal times uh, because there's likely going to be very little renewables in the grid at those point in time. So you can, for example, use the electricity uh, map API, which we looked at way in the early beginning with, uh, with all the countries. And you can see, okay, where uh, is, um, where is carbon intensity really low right now? And can I move my training there? Because the good thing about training machine learning, it's not necessarily needed real time, right? It's not um, in uh, data that we need, like at the snap of our fingers that need to be super low latency. Like we can batch this and, and plan it. So that's something to contemplate. If you've done this reduce or you can't do this reduce, maybe you can think about reusing. And in this case, reusing other models. We uh, learned that the development of new models uh, is a lot higher than just training them. So maybe there are open source models available which, which you can use um, and therefore at least skip this uh, de development part of your software. And then you can also think about can we pay this forward? Can we make our models open source and in that case you know, use the, the cost that we paid in carbon for training these or for developing these models, can we at least um, sort of share that with someone else? And lastly, maybe you have you can recycle your old uh, ML and AI solutions for new problems. Maybe they don't fit that specific thing anymore, but you know, they can be recycled into something else, at least worth contemplating before throwing away a good model. Okay, that was quite a lot. Thanks for making it all the way here. Um, I was um, entrusted to hand out these learner badges, uh, which is something called Azure Heroes. If you uh, wanna check it out, you can scan this QR code and then there'll be like instructions you can follow. If you wanna know more about this, um, you can go to this link uh, and nominate yourself or other community friends and there are more available badges, which is pretty fun. There is one new, which has to do with like green, uh, I don't remember what's called like green developer or something like that, which is very cute. It like holds a little uh, plant. It's very, very nice. Okay, uh, thank you so much for staying with me. Uh, there will be a break now and then there'll be more questions. So I hope you got some in store for me. <laughs>